The Nick Scott Effect. The Nick Scott Effect. Available on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Facebook Watch, and everywhere podcasts are found. Interview requests and show notes available at djnickscott.com. How do I look, Doctor? <laughs> <laughs> you look good, brother. So we have to tell the listeners, this is our second attempt at this interview. Uh, yes. we, we had an hour in the in the can, as we call it in the business. And there were a little bit of some technical issues, but, but I thought it was a great interview. And uh, Burke, who's a great guy, and your manager and I talked, and we decided maybe to to do it again. A little clear audio, so uh, I'm I'm very grateful for you taking the time out of your busy day today to to chat with me. No problem, no problem. So we'll jump right in, man. As I said, this is a uh, this is our second attempt at this. I'm so grateful for you doing it. And when we talked earlier in the week, you were at home in Logan, West Virginia. Yeah. Now you're in South Carolina. Tell me a little bit what what you're doing in South Carolina today. Uh, I do a special event every year for the Boys and Girls Club down here in uh, Buford. And um, so uh, last night we had a show with uh, Voices of Classic Soul. That's one platter, one drifter, and a guy that was in the Four Tops and the Temptations. So that's Joe Coleman, Joe Blunt, and Theo Peoples. And last night I was a special guest on their concert to raise money for, you know, the Boys and Girls Club. And tonight it's, it's a reverse. It's my show, and then they're my special guests. Oh, wow. And so um, I just actually, I don't know what I just did with that sticker, but. I, I believe your uh, lady friend took it off for you. She takes it, took it off me before. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know she took it. <laughs> but I had a sticker. I just visited the school. Every time I come down here, I, I go to these schools and, you know, encourage kids to dream big, stay in school. You know, and never give up. So, you know, that's kind of like my thing. It's never too late to graduate. That's awesome. And I know you're making a huge impact with that uh, here in your home state, in West Virginia. You're all yeah. over the billboards. You're all over their ad campaigns. And we discussed this on, on the uh, earlier interview. You know, one thing that the pandemic did for you, and you've been outspoken about this, was to go back and finish your diploma. So walk me through that. What was the inspiration to go ahead and finally finish your high school GED? Oh, the ultimate inspiration was, you know, to just uh, to be a good role model. I mean, I go to schools all across the, uh, you know, America, and I talk to kids about staying in school. But it's hard to do that, you know, or even try to convince them to do that when you haven't done it yourself. So the thing is lead by example. And the more schools that I went to, the more it started to bother me. I was just like, I'm telling kids to stay in school, and and if they actually go Google me, they realize that I never was in. I didn't stay in school. When did you leave school? What grade? Eleventh uh, grade. It oh started, man, you were close to finishing. Yeah, but it it started it started getting bad in you know tenth grade. Because ninth grade, you just you're a freshman in high school. You learn the school. You learn everything. And so you make it to the 10th grade. But by 10th grade, you settled in, start to realize who your friends are, what hallways not to walk down. And the reason I say this is because my school was like the school all lean on me. <laughs> you know, and then being from West Virginia, I hadn't seen anything like that. Yeah. You know, and my parents split up and moved me from West Virginia to Detroit, Michigan. So when I got to Detroit, Michigan, it's a whole new environment. School is even a different environment. It's a whole nother jungle. And so, like I said, by the time I was in the 10th grade, I started to realize, you know, uh, who your friends were, what cliques to hang out with, who to stay away from, what hallways not to walk down. And then when it got to that point in my life where it was complicated for me to get to school and back home in one piece, I was like, it's time for me to quit school. Now, this was in Detroit, correct? In Detroit, yeah. I okay. quit school in Detroit, Michigan. Yeah, And it was just because of the environment. The environment was just so bad and so crazy that I didn't want to be there no more. You know, have and, and, have and you I thought about to, taking your platform and that experience maybe back to Detroit to maybe help some of those schools in Michigan? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's that's a 
very big possibility. I, I, I would love to do that. Um, like I said, I didn't want to drop out of school. It was just it was just my environment. And there's a lot of kids there right now still going through that same thing. And I'm pretty sure even worse now because Detroit, like, really, really got bad, mm-hmm. you know, after the 90s. You know, and, um, and so when the pandemic hit, I decided to go back to school. And, and the process was made kind of easy because of the adult education in West Virginia. Uh, mm-hmm. West Virginia Adult Education, they made it easy. You can just sign up online and, you know, you do a couple of courses on ed- edgenuity.com. You go to Ralph Lawrence Technical Center on Three Mile Curve. You know, you take a couple of uh, quick quizzes and tests and talk to the teachers and they teach you how to put your mind back in the frame of algebra yeah. <laughs> with, with alphabets and numbers mixing together. You know, and I, and I realized, you know, um, I had to get my mindset back in the high school to do it. And I was able to do that. You know, I turned off Netflix, turned off ESPN, <laughs> and I, I sit down and, and I buckle down and I got it. And uh, the first test that I took, I passed everything except for the math. And and I was kind of devastated about that because math and science is like my two favorite subjects. But... I realized how rusty I was in that area because I didn't realize anymore that in math, you some math equations, you have to understand the words in those equations to start solving them, you know? Sure. Yeah. So it's, what's the sum of X seven or, you know, or something yeah. like that. So it's just like I had to retrain my brain in that and retrain the study, getting study habits and, you know, I, I actually just uh, asked, you know, people in my life that I knew who was good at school, like my sister, my sister Melinda, is really, really good at school. She made straight A's. And so I asked her after I failed that math part, I went back to her and I was like, how do you study for a math test? And she said, how do you study for a math test? <laughs> I said... <laughs> I said, uh, I, I cram, I cram, I study for hours, you know, and the next day I go into the classroom and take the test and my mind was blank. She was like, you don't want to do it like this. She said, your brain doesn't work like that. She said, you had the type of brain where you need to study 10 minutes, five minutes before you walk into that classroom. Mm-hmm. And that's what I did. I studied a little bit in my car in the parking lot and then I went in the building and I aced it. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, my I'm the same way. I remember in uh, high school and college cramming the night before and then yeah. sitting in the class and <laughs> having the thing in front of me going, wait, what was that? You know, what? It, it, would, what? it wouldn't retain. But if I did like a refresher going in that morning, I would do uh, a whole lot better. It's funny yeah. thinking back to school. My favorite subjects were history and uh, science, math and English. Uh, were my least favorites, which I always make a joke. You know, if I'm doing a performance somewhere, maybe a private event for a wedding or something, uh, if I mispronounce someone's name, I'll say, I, I apologize. I learned how to read in Ohio. <laughs> and that usually gets a pretty good joke, you know, a pretty good laugh, you know, yeah. or uh, my math and skills, you know. I'll, I'll be looking at a, a a tip to leave a waitress, and I'll be like, you know, what's 37, what's 15% of $37.58? And my wife <laughs> right. would be like, really? you know, uh, but, uh, but, dude, that's awesome. I'm proud of you, and, and I'm sure you're a, a great example for adults even that are out there that want to finish that part of their life and get their GED. Now, yeah, where I, can it, someone it, it, get that information to finish their GED? Oh, uh, You can go to adulted.com, right? Yeah, westvirginiaadulted.com. There you go. And it'll point you in the right directions. And it's absolutely free. That's what's the great part about it. You know, most places you got to pay to do that. And I actually took some online high school stuff probably in like the early 2000s or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it was costing me like $500. And I never got my diploma from those from those schools. <laughs> so I would just pay my money and I would take all the tests. And they would tell me that I passed because I would never get that diploma. I would never get wow. it in that. It really bothered me that I didn't graduate because I knew some kids that that came out of high school that I knew I was smarter than. 
Mm-hmm. And I was just like, how did he get a diploma? I did like, so it was just like, it was, it was a tough thing to have to deal with, especially when you're looking at all your peers and all your friends that's, you know, they're going above and beyond you. And you, and you realize you're like, wow, I could have did the same thing and, and I wasted it. And so, but the hardest part about it is, is, is the fear of being mm-hmm. picked on about it, being, you know, bullied about it. You know, what you doing? What you, why are you still in high school? Like, why are you in school? So I was just like, man, look, I don't even care. I don't, I don't care what anybody thinks. I got to do this for me. So I put all that aside and I let that fear go and I let that pride go. And I sit in that classroom and and, it, and it's really crazy for, for me to sit in that classroom you know, or any other famous person. Because when you're sitting there, the person next to you is like. (laughs) (laughs) So they're looking at you. Like, and I'm sitting there like, what, what? And they're looking at you like, why are you here? I'm like, I'm trying to get my diploma like you. Oh, you didn't graduate high school? No. (laughs) No, I'm just here because I like the environment. (laughs) <laughs> right, you know, so it's it's kind of it kind of throws you off because you just want to fit in at that moment, but you can't. Yeah, so it was kind of difficult so, for me in that aspect, but I got through it. All right, guys, this episode of the podcast is sponsored by the Appalachian Outpost. They're located in Lyburn, West Virginia. If you're familiar with the town of Logan or Man, West Virginia, it's literally literally right in between the two, and it is a resort that is customized for your trail rider, your side-by-side, your four-wheelers, your big souped-up Jeeps and rock crawlers. They have cabins, so you and your crew, no matter where you're from, you could come down to Lyburn, haul your toys along with you on your trailers, have a a wonderful cabin to stay in that feels just like home, and you get up in the morning, you hit the trail. The the trailhead rock house, I had to think about it for a second, is right there near the Appalachian Outpost, so you can literally hit the trailhead and, and go ride. And then when you come back, they got dinner waiting on you at the Broken Axle. My friends Leah and Fuji own the Broken Axle. It's a bar restaurant that is absolutely delicious. So book your reservation now for you and your riding crew at the AppalachianOutpost.com. What took you, because I didn't know you were in Detroit at one point, um, what brought you back from Detroit to West Virginia? How did that transition happen? Uh, I never wanted to be in Detroit. You know, and um, when my mom moved me there, it was 1984. But then she left at around about 92. Mm-hmm. So like right before I was getting ready to graduate high school, she left and moved back. Then my brother moved back, and I stayed there because I had a son. You know, and I wanted to work out with this girl, but it, it didn't. And so while I was still up there, my little brother and me and him were like, you know, super close. But he just chose a different path than I did. And uh, it got him in trouble. And so in 2000, 2001, he was getting ready to go to prison. Oh, wow. And I just, want, I just wanted to spend, you know, that time with him before he went to prison. And so I moved back to Logan, West Virginia. And just hang out with my little brother, you know. And, um, and once I got a job, I got a job at, uh, I believe it was Bob Evans. My first job was Bob Evans down there. I know where that was. Yeah. It's no longer there there. now. Is it still still there? there. The one right by Walmart? Yeah, Fountain Place. Okay. I thought it was gone. No, it's still there. (laughs) We we just just went there during the holiday season. I took the Klein twins there. They loved it. They're from Canada, so they don't ever get Bob Evans. And they was like, oh, my God, it's the best food ever. It's like it's Bob Evans. But I loved it. But um, I got that job. And then, you know, I started hanging out with my little brother. And then it was his time to go to prison. And then once he went to jail, I just stayed. And I started, like, doing things to better my community. Like, you know, singing the weekend programs and doing talent shows and stuff like that. Just to help out the community, you know, and encourage some kids to keep dreaming. You know, and never give up. And that's how I ended up back in West Virginia, and I've been there ever since. So how did you hear about America's Got Talent 
and in Logan, West Virginia, and and how did you get to the audition? I heard about it the same way you hear about you know American Idol or X Factor or you know Star Search or anything. It was just it was TV, radio, commercial stuff like that. But I never and you know a lot of people was coming up to me telling me that I should go on you know American Idol or X Factor and all these shows, and I was just like, I was like, ah, no, I don't like singing for competition. And I kept I kept that attitude for a long time. I just kept doing my one man shows. You know, and they're selling out. But at the same time, I was just, people was coming up to me like, you got to go on American Idol. You have to go on American Idol. You got to go on America's Got Talent. You got to go on these shows. And I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not about to go on any of these shows let them make a fool out of me. You know, and, and that was my attitude with it. But God had a different plan. You know, so as I'm doing all these shows, God is grooming me. He's getting me ready for a stage like America's Got Talent without me even realizing it. I didn't even realize how great I was getting or how good I was getting. And I get to the point where my shows are selling out and I'm starting to make a name for myself. I'm starting to sign autographs for kids and adults coming up to me asking me for autographs in the parking lot of the Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> <laughs> So it was things like that. And then it was just like, while I was actually doing some of those shows, somebody robbed my house. And when they robbed my house, it made me sad. It made me angry, sad. I was frustrated. I was, I was, I was torn because I had been doing so much, you know, for the community. And I just, I felt like the community should have protected me. It should have never let nobody rob my house. But, you know, people need things. So they robbed my house while I was gone. And like I said, I got angry. I got really mad. And then my Detroit side kicked in. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, oh, my goodness. You really? This is how y'all want to play it? Okay, I'm robbing every drug dealer that comes to Logan County. And that's that's what I thought. I was like, I'm going to just rob every drug dealer. There's nobody they can tell. It would just be a you know, a shootout or something or a fight. Can't tell of me. Yeah. But then on the other side, my good side kicked in. And it said, listen, you have nothing to lose now and everything to gain. All you need is a bigger stage. And I was like, wow. And I started weighing my options. Like, okay, if I listen to my bad side, I got to deal with a shootout or possibly be getting killed or possibly killing somebody or just going to prison and spending the rest of my life there. But if I do this, I can actually change my whole life forever and do exactly what I love to do, which is entertain people. Where do I find that bigger stage? And right at that moment, I kid you not, the television in the room that I was sitting in went to a commercial. And it was Howie Mandel. Are you the next winner of America's Got Talent? Do you have what it takes to headline your own show in Vegas? Are you <laughs> our next million dollar prize winner? I, I got to totally- say that is a spot on impression. <laughs> oh my God. It, it it blew me away. And I was just sitting there like, I was like, that's it. That is the bigger stage. And I went in a room, signed up on the computer. I waited for a confirmation email. It probably took like two and a half, three weeks for that. And then when I got the email, they told me to wait for a phone call. Took another about two weeks for that. And when I got the phone call, the girl that I was with at the time thought it was a prank or something, or or she was just hating on me. I don't know what it was, but she hung up the phone on America's Got Talent when they called my house. The first time they called, she hung up. Boom. They called back. Like, ma'am, please don't hang up the phone. We're looking for Landau Eugene Murphy Jr., and then she gives me the phone. She's screaming at the top of her lungs, like, I can't believe this. And I'm like, yeah, I can. <laughs> <laughs> it's only popping from right now. And so I get on the phone. They ask me how I want to do my audition. I can do it in two different ways. I can go to several different states and, you know, perform live in front of uh, judges. Or I can submit a video of myself. I already had in my mind what I was going to do as far as the genre. So I was picking Frank Sinatra. So I was just like, okay, well, since I'm doing Sinatra, I don't want to just send in a video because we live in a world today where you can just swipe 
You know what I'm saying? And I was yeah. just like, they really need to see me to right. really get the real impact of this. And so I was like, okay, I want to come to New York. And he was like, okay, well, I'll see you in New York. Everything after that we pay for, you got to get yourself to New York. And I was just like, okay. And so I saved up all my money, you know, washing cars and doing the little shows that I had been doing. And I went to New York, and it changed my life forever. I remember watching your audition live, and I remember uh, you were, they, they built the package. You were the last audition for the day. Was that true, or was that yeah, cinematic? Yeah. I was actually the last person. No, I actually, the Smodgy Brothers was the last act. I was the okay. last, I guess, uh, an act without, you know, gasoline. <laughs> 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 yeah, because the Smodgy Brothers was the, uh, the trick motorcycle riders. They was jumping over each other's heads. They was, you know, doing all these tricks on these ramps and all this stuff. So they had to let them go last because the exhaust from the motorcycles gotcha. would fill up the, uh, the yeah. theater. Yeah, but I was really the last person because um, I remember coming in the audition, trying to go first. I wanted to just get it out of the way, but somehow, like the universe, just kept pushing me to the to the end. So, like even in the first audition, when I walked in the room, there's no celebrity judges; it's just you and like you know the producers of the show and things like that. And I walk up, I sit in the actually sit in the last seat because I thought that they were going to call us from that end. And I was just like, okay, I'll, I'll just sit here and then this way I'll, I'll get to watch everybody. So they call me first. I get up, but they don't have the, uh, the machine to play my track. And it was like, oh, I'm sorry. We don't have equipment in here right now. Um, can you just wait and let all the rest of these people go through and then we'll get that equipment down here and you can do your audition. And I was like, okay, cool, don't worry about it. So I sit down, now I get to watch everybody do their audition. You know, so I'm watching everybody go through the routine. I see people like messing with their hair while they're saying, pinching <laughs> it in their pockets, playing in their ear, you know. <laughs> They were just doing like all kind of because they're nervous, so they're just doing anything that they can to like soothe themselves. I sit there and watch that, and I watch the judges. You know, I watch the producers. I watched everybody's reactions. I was like, these people are good, but they're, they're missing that one thing, and that's like star wow factor. They don't have it. They have the voice, but if you're shy, what difference does it make? You know what I'm yeah. saying? Mm -hmm. And so I watched them do that, and then they call, it gets to me again, they go, okay, you're up next. And I come up again, they go, oh, that's right, we were supposed to get that equipment in here. Oh, my gosh, uh, I don't know what we're going to do. You think we can call Johnny and get him down here to bring the, uh, uh, just, you know, a CD player or something? And I was like, don't worry about it, I'll do it a cappella. What, I had what was watched. it on? Was it a CD it was a or a CD, thumb drive? See, in the contract, oh, yeah. it says you can, uh, you can bring a 90-second instrumental of whatever song you're going to sing. Okay. You know, and so that's what I did. I followed all the rules. I signed, dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. And I was the only person in that room that was actually prepared. I came there actually prepared, like ready for this audition. And I watched everybody else fumble the ball. And so I was just sitting there like, wow. And then they called me up and I get up and they was just like, no, I'm sorry. We got to get this equipment. And I was like, don't worry about it. I'll just... I'd do it a cappella. It's like, are you sure? And I was like, yes, I'll, I'll just do it like this. So I took a deep breath and I started singing, I would sacrifice anything, come what might, for the sake of having you live in spite of the warning voice. Comes in the night and repeats how it yells in my ear. Don't you know, you fool? You know, I started going into the whole thing, man. <laughs> and I looked around, and all the contestants, the judges, everybody was like, oh, my God. They were all into it, just from the snap of my fingers and my voice. There's no track playing at all. And when I finished, they started looking through their paperwork like, oh, my gosh, where have you been? How old are you? And I was like, I'm 35. They was like, no way. Where have you been all our lives? 
like, I don't know, washing cars. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, have you ever auditioned for anything? Or something I was like, well, I sing, you know, for my friends and family and stuff like that. And then I do kind of like these little shows in my community back home. But I've never, like, pursued, like, a real career out of it. And it's like, this is absolutely brilliant. And they was like, is that all you sing? And I was like, no, I sing, you know, all kind of genres from Prince, Michael Jackson, Bluegrass, Oprah's Boys, Brian Adams, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. Cindy Lauper. I sing everything. <laughs> You know, and Cindy Lopper. Yeah. Time Let me hear time. some Cindy Lopper. Huh? Can you hit me with some Cindy Lopper on the spot? If you're lost and you look and you will find me. Time after time. Yes. If you fall, I will catch you. I'll be waiting. Time, time after time. time. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's what's up. So Please I, tell I me you do some of that in your live shows. You've oh, got yeah. to. That's gold. I do, yeah. I do that in my shows just to, you know, let the audience know my background. That's they awesome. They really assume that that's all you do. And then a lot of them assume, like, how do you even get into this <laughs> genre? You know? And I tell them, you know, it was Bugs Bunny, Merry Melodies, Looney Tunes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because, you know, the singing rooster used to come out on stage. I mean, we'd be in the chicken coop. And then come back and go, bah, 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 bah. and all and then, and then the other chickens would fall <laughs> over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So <laughs> all that was my childhood, and I, I started mimicking those things, and it is just like I said, it was just God's way of grooming me without me even realizing it, and it just paid off yeah. in my life. You so know, in uh, your audition, you walk out, and I think. You, you see that moment where you're starstruck with Howie and you know, we're, we're similar age. I grew up with uh, Bobby's world. Yeah. You know, and you know, Bobby had like a mullet uh, or Howie had like a mullet back in those days, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, and you walk out, you're a little starstruck with him. And then, uh, I'm not the biggest fan of Pierce Morgan. Now I, I don't know him personally, but in some of the shows I've seen him on, whether it be political commentary or America's Got Talent, he just comes across as a rude individual. So yeah. that's my opinion. And he just like legs right into you for chewing gum. Now, I yeah. have to ask, in the chewing gum part of that audition, was it for your nerves to settle your nerves? Yeah, it was a lot of that. And I also had a partial in my mouth. So I had a fake uh... tooth. And I had broke the clamps off because it was scratching the enamel off my teeth in the back. Ah. Oh. So I would I would snap it in my mouth, but it wouldn't like hold in there. So I would use the chewing gum to actually hold it in my mouth. You know, that was a poor man's, you know, <laughs> quick. But it fix. worked. And it worked. <laughs> but um when I got yeah. on stage, being starstruck and being nervous, I started yeah. chewing the gum. <laughs> <laughs> And then I immediately heard the first person who said that to me was actually Sharon Osbourne. Yeah. She's oh, like, she said, are you chewing, chewing gum? gum? Like, Is he chewing <laughs> gum? Oh, my like, gosh. And then Pierce was like sitting there with his pen. He's like tapping his pen, looking at me like. He's like, uh, are you chewing gum? I wouldn't do that if I were you. Yeah. You know, and, and you he, put it in your he, pants he, pocket. Yeah, he took it as a sign of disrespect, but he didn't know. That's, that's just people judging a book by its cover. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He never even let me explain the gum part. He just he just went to that part. So I, I just brushed it off real quick. I got something to do here. I ain't got time for him. Well, <laughs> you and know? you made it. You made it funny. You made it, you know, you kind of did a little thing there, putting it in, yeah. you know. And my question was, man, he just ruined a pair of jeans. <laughs> no, it actually, it's, it stuck to a $10 bill. <laughs> yeah, I had a, I had a $10 bill. I had a ten dollar bill in my pocket, and it was it was in my pocket like this, you know. And when I stuck my hand in my pocket with the gum, it went inside like this. Oh! And I just pulled it back out, you know. And it's, it's in my pocket, so I do the Did whole. Did you keep that ten dollar bill as a souvenir? Yeah, I still have it. It's in a shadow box. You know, That's people awesome. try to buy that actually. But that's um, crazy. actually, um, after after audition, I went backstage. I was like, wow, I just changed my whole life. And I remember like a couple of the contestants came up to me like, uh, 
I can't remember their names. What was their name? It's probably Wreck and Tack or, or one of those groups. They come up to me like, did you really stick your gum in your pocket? And I was like, <laughs> oh, man. So I go in my pocket. I'm like, yeah. But I was like, oh, it stuck to this $10 bill. And I pulled a $10 bill apart. It kind of like ripped right here. Yeah. But the gum is like, you know, all ooey gooey in there. And I just, <laughs> I kept it together. And they was like, oh, man, this guy, he's like, can I have that? And I was like, mm. I was like, nah. And I kept it. <laughs> but she has, a, she has a picture of it. But I got a picture of nice. it right here. Here it is. Oh, there it is. Yep. That is awesome. That's the gun. I would not get rid of that. That's something Stuck I would pass down to my kids. I would pass that in the shadow box down to my kids and all that if I was you. Yeah, yeah. So um, I put it back in my pocket. I still have those jeans. I still have that that corduroy jacket and the rock and wear stripe button up shirt. Only thing I don't have is the the PF flyer shoes that I had on. Somebody stole them. Man, you yeah. you you get a lot of stuff stolen from you, man. But I, I, I think the reason I get a lot of stuff stolen is because I don't I don't I just don't cherish worldly things. That's a good and it's thing. Just like because they come and go. I mean, you know, people need them. You know, I mean, you can have how many pair of shoes do you need? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, if if, if I'm going to keep a pair of shoes, they got to be somewhere up in my closet, in the box, put away. Because if not, then my friends will walk in and they'll grab them. My cousins will walk in and they'll grab them. Or we're getting ready to go hoop somewhere in the neighborhood. I'm like, man, we got I need a pair of shoes, man. Give me a pair of shoes. I go in my closet and just grab a pair of shoes and give them to them. You need brand new George. You're about to go ruin. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. But that's just the way I am with, you know, with worldly things. I mean... I, I I put my value in people, like uh, yeah. you know, friendships and love, and um, you know, just sentimental things. But when it comes to you know clothes and stuff like that, I just, I really don't have, you know, I, I don't protect them. I don't, I'm not about to get up and iron my jeans. Like, <laughs> oh, it's got to be creased just right. I'm just not. You know that what, guy. my wife. You know what, my wife found me that I thought was the silliest thing in the world, and now. I use it almost every day. Have you seen those steamer. handheld steamers? I got one right there. Dude, I wear That's mine I out. <laughs> I use that on my suits before my shows. I just yeah. steam my suit out. Because as long as you keep your, like, if you get your suits dry clean and you keep them in that plastic that comes back with it, mm-hmm. they'll never get wrinkled. You can nope. take them and fold them up in your luggage and anything, zip them in there. And, buy, and when you take them out, you just hang them up in the room you're in for maybe like, 15, 20 minutes, and all the wrinkles fall back out. And if you do yep. have, like, one or two wrinkles somewhere on your shirt or something, you just pull that steamer out and run it across it, and you're good. You don't have to yep. set up the ironing board. You don't have to do any of those things. So speaking yeah. of your shows, I know for the last uh, 11, 12 years since you won American, uh, America's Got Talent, you've been uh, booking and performing on covers. And you and I discussed this earlier in the week that you are piecing together an original album and original work. And so tell us a little bit about your original project. My original project is a a combination of songs that I write myself and, you know, in the likeness of Nat King Cole, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, you know, so, so the songs that I want to put out are going to be all originals. That way I get to own them, you know, all the publishing, all that stuff. And that's that's what it all comes down to. Just owning everything about it. Anything about your idea, you should be able to own it. I shouldn't be able to yeah. own, you know, part of this podcast just because I was on it, right? It's right. your podcast. And so it's the same thing with music. I want to own it all. And right now in my career, I've just been doing covers. So I've been I've been basically placing money into the pockets of Frank Sinatra's grandkids. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's one way. I I never looked at it that way, but you're right. It's it's the truth. (laughs) Yeah, it's the truth. You know, without them ever hitting the stage or singing anywhere, I'm they're getting paid in their sleep off of me. Mm -hmm. You know, and and I'm grateful for Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and Nat King Cole and all these guys for you know paving the way for a young man like myself. But there's got to come a point in my career where I'm starting to pave the way for somebody else. You know, so doing cover songs, I'm always going to have those cover songs in my back pocket. Always. Somebody come Mm -hmm. to me and say, hey, 
I love that original song you did. But can you do uh, "Fly Me to the Moon"? I can. I can just pull "Fly Me to the Moon" out like that. But I rather have those original songs. So I'm writing, you know, original songs in the likeness of those guys. And and then what I want them to do is I want to I want to be able to put that song on, and somebody say, "Oh my God, who is that?" I'm like, is that Frank Sinatra? Is that Nat King Cole? Is that Dean Martin? I'm like, no, that's Lando. Really? Is that an original song? Yes. But it's in the likeness of those guys. So it gives you that same feeling, that classic feel, you know? And, you know, I, ju I just want to do that and um, actually, you know, change the world with some great lyrics because, you know, the music industry has is, is changed so much. I mean, even the hip hop that me and you grew up on is not the same no more. You know, now it's really, 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 really about killing and shooting and drugs and girls and clothes and fashion and worldly things instead of, you know, life. You know, growing up as a, a, a young boy looking up to his dad, you know? Yeah. And that's that's what I want my music to, to feel like. It's blue sky, puffy cloud music. We mentioned on the earlier podcast, that's going to be the title of the album, Blue Sky, Puffy <laughs> Cloud. Landau, Eugene Murphy Puffy. Jr., Blue yes, Sky, right. Puffy Cloud. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Number one on iTunes. Um, so where do, you draw, where do you draw inspiration when you write? Uh, I, I've had a lot of uh, musicians on the podcast. I've interviewed a lot of musicians in my radio career. And it seems like either you draw inspiration in the moment, and I know guys that can write a complete song in the two minutes because whatever's happening or unfolding in front of them and they'll write a, a song completely on what is happening in their life at that moment. And then I know guys that do things compartmentalized in sections, you know, they'll write uh, a verse or uh, a hook here. And then in two weeks they'll draw inspiration from something else and then kind of yeah. piece it all together. So how do you write material? Uh, it comes in a variety of different ways. It comes in those two ways that you just mentioned. And then also, you know, you can actually, um, it can come in a conversation with somebody. I mean, just like me and you with the Blue Sky Puppy Clouds, just that being the title of the album, that's another way that we come up with them. Um, I could be eating a sandwich and it's too hot and I'll say something that just makes sense. <laughs> you know, and I'll write that down. You know, or, you know. <laughs> Woo, my tongue's on fire. There's a lyric. Yeah. <laughs> you know. You know things like that, man. They they come and go, I and mean, like I said, I've written I've written songs that took me, you know, no more than five minutes to write, just because of the mood. How many that I was songs gonna... do you think you have in the? How many songs do you think you have in the bank now, ready to roll? Uh, if you if you counting them all, like R and B, blues, rap, all of that, I'm probably about two hundred and forty. Two hundred and forty songs. Yeah, and then I lost about 247 songs because my son decided to play video games on my home studio computer. <laughs> oh, no. Were you able yeah. to recall, were you able to, to mentally recall some of the, like the melodies or hooks yeah, yeah. or lyrics? Of it? Okay. I got a lot of that in my, in my just in my memory and it can be just a yeah. key, one note that it'll take me right up like, oh, I remember that song and then I'll go and do it. But I still have the hard drive. I just got to find somebody that can like snatch most of it out and then I can piece it all back together. But it's like 247 songs on this hard drive that I can't even get. And they're hip hop, R&B, gospel, classic, you know, great American songbook songs, just melodies, different beats and things that I was working with. He just, he lost all of it. And I kept telling him like, stop playing video games on my, I, I, you have a laptop in your room, but he would take like, my kid is like a little weird genius. And he would take all the TVs in my house and wrap them around his bed. <laughs> my computer monitors, all of my monitors, his laptop, he would link it all together. My smart TV, everything, you know, like those gamers that, you know, yeah, they had yeah. a chair and all that. He was sitting in his room like, just playing video games with every month. I come home, I'm getting ready to watch ESPN. My TV is in his room. And he's <laughs> he's got like Wizards and Warlords going on over here. He's got Grand Theft Auto on this one. He's got Need for Speed on this one. And then he's in the chat room on the middle screen. I was just like, oh my God, bro. But that's what he would do. And he, he crashed my hard drive. 
And so I got the hard drive, you know, and I rebuilt my studio, but I got that hard drive and I'm just trying to find me a tech geek that, you know, can like go in there and grab it all. Well, and a uh, little unpaid shameless plug here. I have some good friends at work at Best Buy and yeah. local to us, the Best Buy there in South Charleston. Yeah. Uh, if you go to the Geek Squad there, um, they could probably recover some of that for you. Now, of course, there'll be a fee involved. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's I mean, awesome. what's a what's a hundred, couple hundred bucks for right. your, your, your songs? So uh, yeah. that's the first place I'd start. Second place, you can Google. Uh, you know, IT professionals or computer or data recovery. I think there's some actual websites where you can find um, places that do specifically. It's called data recovery. Right. Um, you might have to mail or ship that hard drive to them. and They could be in California. Right. Um, and they'll do data recovery, and then they'll mail it back to you again. There's That's how they make money, so there'll be a fee involved. But if I'm in your shoes, I'm thinking, man, it's worth – whatever that fee is to get my material back. Yeah, yeah, it's worth thousands to me. I mean, it's yeah, just, 200, it's like 247 complete songs. Remember data recovery and uh they should be able to help you for sure. Okay. So when do you think you'll actually hit the studio if you haven't already and actually start producing, compiling and recording this record? Oh, right now I'm actually I'm in and out of the studio because I got a studio at my house, so I do a lot of it. You know, when everybody sleep, I'm in the studio just you know working on different beats and things like that, different melodies. But uh, I want I want to have it done. I guess we, we want to be in, in the studio and have the project complete by you know April. But I, I, I want to be in the studio by March at least, and just it, release it by April. Now, would you do it from your studio or would you do it from a, a local studio? Uh, any way possible. You know, even my studio is good enough. But uh, the thing is, you're getting all these players together and all these guys ain't going to yeah. fit in that one room in my studio. So we probably <laughs> have to we have to try to rent the studio like we did for my Christmas album. I did it at, uh, at a studio in Huntington with uh, Richie Collins. Yeah, I know Richie. Mm -hmm. Richie did my – he did my Christmas album. Uh, album and he also it sounds did, great and he also um engineered my live from caesar's palace album also uh i had chris ojeda on the podcast a few yeah. months ago he's the lead singer of byzantine yeah and he built a studio practice rehearsal center uh here in the charleston area okay um so maybe that's another venue to to check out in the charleston yeah. area yeah because most yeah. of my players are from charleston so that's 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 as close as I want to be. I and I could that. probably, uh, off air, I could probably link you two up and get you two connected, you and Chris. Great. Uh, yeah. and maybe you guys could work something out in the future. Yeah, that'd so, be great. I'm excited to hear original Landau because, you know, I, I got to know you through America's Got Talent. Obviously, with America's Got Talent, it was that, Cor is it pronounced Crooner? Coroner? How do you pronounce it? Crooner. That? Crooner. I was way off. <laughs> <laughs> Corona. Corona, that too. I love them as well. So, <laughs> but, but that, that's what we got to love and know about Landau. So, knowing your talent, I think original music and just letting your creativity flow, I, I can't wait to see that. Yeah, I can't wait either, man. It's, it's, it's going to be amazing. And I mean, I, I even wrote a song about the girl that I'm doing. Her name is Peyton. And I had a song called Pay a Ton, like Peyton. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to sing it for you, but I don't want to give it away. But it, it, it's it's just it's amazing. It's a beautiful song, and I played it for her, and she was like in tears. Like it's so good, and I I made the melody and everything on the keyboard myself. And like I said, I I don't I can't read music. I can do anything by ear. Mm -hmm. I have a gift of just you know tapping out a melody and then remembering what I tapped out and doing it over, or just just looping it, <laughs> you know, and then adding more to it and loop that and then. You know, going to a bridge or a chorus and things like that. So, I'm just good at those type of things. But I, I have, I have some amazing songs. I can't wait. And you know, and this is, this is solidifying my name into the Great American Songbook. How you know, do you dwindle down uh, 270? I think is what you said. Songs. How do you pick? Okay, I want to do 10, or I want to do 12 of. Uh, I, I think I would pick them based on the moods that these songs give me. Like if, 
like if I want to be up, I want to listen to up music, you know? Sure. And so if I want my CD to be half up, half down, I'm going to pick all the up songs that I can on this side. And then on the B side, it's going to be all the down songs, you know, or you can like do four ups and then one down, another up, then two down and another couple ups and then go out with a bang. So it's all about how you want to put this album together to paint that picture. Because you want to take people on a roller coaster ride. And I like for my songs to go from one song and then it can go right into that next song because of the last part of that melody or the last verse in that song. Because I want to, st- I want to tell a story. And I, and that's one of my things that I hate about the music industry now. It's like even when you put on a rap CD, it's like the song is here and then that song is over here and then that song is up here and that song is down there. This song is over here. It's never like, a connected roller coaster ride. You remember when we used to listen to CDs and you used to pull them out and you open up the thing and read all the information on the side, but every song was like a, <laughs> you know, it, it, it yep. puts you in a place. By the time you got to the end of that album, you're like, wow, that was a fantastic journey. Now you don't get that no more in music. No. You never get that no more, you know? You I think the that. last album that I listened to from front to back, there's a rock band by the name of Ghost that I right. really like. They have a new album that's really good. And then before that, I think it was the latest album from Chris Stapleton, who's yeah. incredible. Uh, and then I believe I listened to the entire new album from Tyler Childers. Right. So, uh, but outside of that, you know, it's whatever songs popping on Spotify or yeah. whatever. Yeah. I think the last hip hop song or CD that I listened to from front to back was probably Chronic, Dr. Dre. Oh, yeah. And, you know, Tupac's All Out On Me. Yep. And then um, after that, it just went all kind of ways. And the, the the latest rock album I probably listened to from front to back was, I, I would say it was Stain. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Stain was one of my favorite groups, too. I love those guys. I got to see Aaron Lewis uh, in Charleston at the Municipal Auditorium. I was two rows back. And what I thought was incredible, because he, I think he does great in country as well. He, he has a great country albums and some great country songs but he was sitting there playing had a full band doing his country hits and then they did some stains big songs uh as well but kind of like a a country twist yeah and what i thought was kind of cool was during like the country twist of it all he would still kind of do that kind of screamo scream sing kind of thing he could do in some of the parts but at the very end of the show the band left he took his microphone put it off to the side Went out in front of the stage, and he yeah. went, everyone, be quiet. Yeah. And this is just his voice. There's no mic. There's no amplification. No nothing. He was like, everyone, shh, be quiet. And he unplugged his acoustic guitar from the house. So it was literally just his voice and just that acoustic guitar in a massive theater. And he said, everyone, be quiet. And he started singing this song called Thank You. Uh, I think the name of it's thank you, but the theme was basically thank you to the fans and thank you for the people in his life and everything. And he sung this on this stage, no amplification, no PA system, no microphones, no nothing, just raw guitar, raw voice. And then he, and then when everyone was quiet at the very end, he's like, I love you and rolled out. And I said, that is the dopest way I think I've seen anyone end a show. Yeah. It was incredible. <laughs> so. I don't know why it's it's funny how things like that stay in your memory when you talk about a certain artist, and I'm sure you have fans that have those moments with you as well. I yeah. know I saw a YouTube video of you uh, singing a cappella Prince. Yeah, do you still do that? Yeah, I still do that. I do. Uh, I go into an a cappella version of When Doves Cry, and I make the whole audience sing it with me. And by the, you know, by the time I get to the second verse, they're going, they're you know they're they're filling in all those parts. Cry. You know, they start yeah. they start singing all those little parts, and I'm just dig if you will the picture. Yeah. Of you and I engaged in the kiss. <laughs> you <laughs> need to have the little frilly thing on. Yeah, I mean, we do all of that, <laughs> man, and then we go straight into purple rain. You know, so you know, my thing is to entertain everybody who, who buys that ticket. You know, I, I treat my fans the same way that I want to be treated at a show. So I don't curse at my audience. I, I don't drop the F-bombs and things like that because there's, you know, great grandkids all up to great grandparents at my show. So it's, it's just all about respect 
and just loving, you know, the fact that I'm so scared on stage and just being able to Still. entertain. Oh, yeah. I, wow. I, I feel like if you're not scared, you're jaded. There's something wrong with you. If, you're, if you can walk out on the stage and not get a sweaty lip or a sweaty nose or sweaty palms, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> it is. It's got, it's, got a, you're, you're, it's either you're super arrogant, you know, or – or you're just jaded. You just don't care about the world or nothing. You don't care I about get it. anxiety that I'm going to bomb. And right. to my knowledge, I've never bombed uh, exactly. you know, behind you know two turntables. Because you turn that fear into your power. Yeah. And that's what I do. Like when I'm on stage, I don't like standing in one spot. A lot of singers just want to stand in front of a microphone because they're so scared to move. So scared. But I can't do that. I get scared if I stand there. Like if I yeah. stand there too long, I really want to panic and just run off the stage like <laughs> you know so I, I keep moving i move back and forth and, and i razzle dazzle them. here's how you razzle dazzle you, you hit a note while you're hitting that note you throw your hand out there <laughs> <laughs> that's what you do you that's hit awesome. a note you hit a note you throw a little hand gesture just, that's all it takes. Just that little thing. I love it. That's all you do, and it, and, it, it, and they watch your hand. You you notice they stop looking at you, and they're looking at your hand. They're looking at your gestures, like your feet movement. They're looking at all those things, and you know, and then it takes away from that that stare. Is that, that stare why? Goes right through you. Is that why when you do when doves cry? Yeah, you're doing this. Yeah. I got you. Yeah. Okay. Make them all. I was like, hey, you go. You guys remember that guy named Prince? And they go, yeah, yeah. I'm like, okay, well, let's do. A, you remember the song Doves Cry? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, okay, well, it's everybody. And I make sure they all start doing it. And if I see a man not snap, I go, you better snap your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> and then the man can't do nothing but laugh, and he starts snapping like, oh my yeah. god. Because now I made him a part of it. I didn't just pull him in because he was sitting there like this. You know, so I'll make him snap his fingers. You got to snap your fingers, too. <laughs> the whole audience starts laughing at him. He starts laughing. And then we go into the whole Doves Cry thing. And like I said, she's never satisfied. You heard that voice way in the back of the room. Somebody just that knows all those parts of that song. Every it's word. So, it's so good, man. And you but know what? In one. that moment, you probably... That one guy, you probably made a fan for life. Exactly. It changes like he's never going to forget it. Like, I sung yeah. Doves Cry with Landau, man, and when the whole audience, like, and everybody heard my voice because I sung that one part. She yeah. never said it back. <laughs> the I love it. But so I, love I was it. thinking back, we talked about AGT, and there was one question I did want to ask you, and I, it completely slipped my mind, so forgive me, but. In watching uh, some of the videos and preparing for our interview, I watched the video of the finale when you won. And there's a moment in that clip where you're standing there next to that that uh, gymnastics dance team. <laughs> yeah. And you're Still standing away. there, and you look stone cold. I mean, you look st like a statue. And I remember thinking to myself, how in the world is he so calm? and collected in that moment. I would be throwing up. <laughs> you know, I had already take me through that up, moment. I had already made up in my mind that I was going on. I didn't think I was winning that show. I mean, I knew that I was good enough to be on the show, but I was still thinking of, you know, America's heartstrings. I mean, you got these little cute, beautiful kids some of them have sicknesses and illnesses, things like that. And they were up there competing because they needed to win the money. You know, all I wanted to do was just make my life better in any kind of way I could. And I think I did that with my very first audition. My you did. first audition changed my whole life. I didn't have to sing another song on America's Got Talent. I had already won in life with just sticking that gun in my pocket and singing that one song. Yeah, And that was it. So it was just like, Doing the whole process and everything, getting all the way up to the finale, I'm still like, oh, when are they going to send me home? Like, when are they going to send me to the house so I can go ahead and get this ball rolling, you know? Yeah. 
And so I'm just, I just remember standing there. And when they, they announced me as the winner, I was just like, oh no. <laughs> like, oh my God. I was like, are you serious? And then I remember all of them came over there and hugged me and everything like that. Because you remember before that even happened, I was out there with Anna Graceman. I think it was like at the top four. I was out there with Anna Graceman and and they tricked they tricked us. Nick Cannon was like, tonight's act that is going home. And then, you know, the lights go dun dun dun. <laughs> everybody's kind of like sitting there, you know, and I'm just looking around and you hear the audience like starting to get anxious and loud. And I'm just like, wow. And it's like, Landau, Eugene Murphy. And the audience is like, oh, and then I was like, dun, dun, dun. you know what I'm saying? And I was just like, but if you, if you go back and if you think I'm kidding, go back and look at that video. When he announces that I'm going home, I was like, thank you. <laughs> I was so happy that I was getting ready to go home because I knew what I wanted to do. I just wanted to get the ball rolling and America's Got Talent was that outlet that I needed. I didn't need right. all the rest of it, but you know, God had a different plan and you know, <laughs> and I'm forever grateful for America's Got Talent for giving me that stage and that opportunity and they changed my life forever. So if they yeah. ever reach out or anything like that, I'm willing to listen to anything that they got to say or, or help them out in any way possible. But, um, yeah, I, I was right. That's what you you described it just right. I was stoned. I was because I was I was already in my mind. I was picturing what I was gonna do when I got home. I was like, when I get home, I'm gonna go right in the studio. I'm gonna finish this demo. Then I'm gonna hit the I'm gonna hit the road. And I'm sitting there thinking, and I ain't hearing nothing that he's saying. I don't hear nothing. I didn't hear nothing. And like I said, when he tricked me, he was like, "Man, that's going home." The whole audience was like. Oh, and I was just like, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and then I looked at Nick and he came up to me like, um, you made it pretty far in this competition. I mean, how does it feel to be a household name now? I was like, feels good, you know, and I, I thank everybody from the bottom of my heart and and you haven't heard the last of me yet. And he's like, okay, well, I just want to let you know one thing. I was just kidding, you both are going through and I just looked at him like, man, are you <laughs> <laughs> I remember telling him, like, bro, are you, are you kidding me? So when I get, you know, after that happened, my phone blows up. And all my fans that I've made and friends and family that I've known, they just blowing my phone up. And like, man, you got to slap Nick Cannon. You need to slap Nick Cannon, <laughs> you know? And then a lot of people was like, man, you tell Nick Cannon we're going to slap him when we see him and all that. And I was just like, nah, Nick is cool. So the next, the very next episode, Nick Cannon asked me, you know, how does it feel that I tricked him and all that? And I was like, yeah, it was good, Nick. You know, a couple of my fans told me, you know, I should slap you upside the head. <laughs> and he just gave me this look like. And then he looked at his bodyguard. <laughs> <laughs> and this bodyguard is this massive little Mighty Mouse dude. This dude wasn't tall. He was just he was big. And he talked like Mike Tyson. <laughs> you know, and he used to always say, I just want the sea sign. That's all I want. I just want to get, let me do the sea sign. And I didn't understand what he was saying, but he was telling me he wanted to fight. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what he was telling me anyway, but but I remember Nick, he gave me that look like. And then he looked at his bodyguard like, and then, you know, but over the years, Nick has been great. He's called me out for a couple of his events for a red nose event where he dances for like 48 hours straight. He, he can't stop Crazy. dancing. He's got to keep dancing. Wow. He raises money for these kids. So we do stuff like that. And then I see him every now and then going through airports, you know, and his bodyguards always, you know, give me love. Like, what's up, Murph? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, that, was, that was amazing, though. That whole journey is amazing, man. And it changed my life tremendously. And like I said, it, it put me right here where I am today where I'm – going out and talking to kids and encourage them to, you know, dream big and, and never give up on, on life itself or, you know, and try to encourage each each and every person around them, whether it's family or friends or just strangers. Just everybody's, you know, got to come together and do good for the greater good because if we don't, then the world becomes, you know, a, a, a really, really bad place and we don't need that. Sure.
Now, I know here shortly, I believe you have a, a sound check coming up. So anytime you got to run, yeah, we can wrap things up. But one thing that came to mind with your instant fame uh, is the Logan Walmart. Uh, for those who don't know, Logan, West Virginia is a very, very small West Virginia town in the Appalachian Mountains, in the heart of the Appalachians. And the Logan Walmart, as we mentioned, he talked about Bob Evans, where all that is, is like the epicenter of Logan. <laughs> yeah. So what was that like when you won? Were you able to just stroll through your hometown Walmart and shop? Or no, man. It was, did you it get was, mugged? It was chaos. So much chaos, man. I, I remember taking my trash out when it aired on television. I caused a six-car pileup in front of my house. Six car accident. And this wow. guy, instead of checking on his truck or checking on the people in his car, he got out and pointed over and was like, hey, it's the Black <laughs> Frank Sinatra. <laughs> I just started laughing like, <laughs> I'm like, you didn't even go check and see if your wife was hurt or nothing. <laughs> like, you got kids in the back, bro. Like, <laughs> the Black Frank Sinatra. He was like, hey, it's the Black Sinatra. That's what he said, man. And I was there's the hey, there's the title of your second original yeah. album. <laughs> old, old brown eyes. That's what they call me. <laughs> yeah. And so even That's like funny. going to Walmart was, you know, was a, a serious task. I used to go to Walmart and like say I would go to Walmart at two PM. I wouldn't get out till like twelve thirty, one o'clock in the morning. Mm. Cause I would be standing there signing autographs, taking pictures with everybody. And I wouldn't say no. I, I, that's something that I can't do is just say no to a fan. Yeah. Because I'm a fan. I'm still a fan. I'm a fan myself. So I, I yeah. can imagine if I seen Michael Jordan or Mike Tyson or, or, or you know, uh, Michael Jackson, I would be the same way. I'd be struck. Like, please, let me get this picture. Can you sign my autograph? Please sign my shoe. Can you sign my shirt? And that's what I would want, you know. And a lot of superstars don't give you that moment, but I just feel like, if I want that moment and then I'm in a position to give somebody else that moment, why not do it? So yeah, it, it, it gets me caught in airports. I've missed flights, you know, signing autographs right there at the gate. They close the door. Mr. Murphy, you got to go. I'm like, one more autograph. <laughs> Mr. Murphy. Uh, <laughs> okay. One more. All right. Thank you so much. Click. I'm like, ah! I'm right here. Oh, we tried yeah. to get you through the gate, sir. You know, and I, I miss flights like that. Just, But I just treat people the way that I want to be treated. So my best bet is to just keep my head down and keep walking. Because as soon as the conversation starts, I'm locked in. And I give everybody that moment. Because that's all we really want. We just want our moment. You want your yes. moment. I want my moment with Michael Jordan. Yes. I want my moment with that guy. I want to be able to sit down and talk to Michael Jordan. Explain to him the impact that he's had on my life. You know, and I'm a singer, but mm -hmm. basketball and music go hand in hand in my world. That's the way it was. You listen to, a, you know, Snoop Dogg and you play basketball to the best of your abilities. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know, I'll put on, you know, the above the rim soundtrack and go out there and try to dominate everything on the court. So it was just, <laughs> it was just one of those things with me. Basketball and music was like the same to me. And so if I could ever meet Michael Jordan, I would, I would explain to him the impact that he had on my life. And I know he's probably heard it a million times, but man, that guy, he, he has no idea the impact that he made on somebody like me. What impact did he have on you? Uh, just everything. I named my son. My first son is named Michael. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> yeah. Awesome. That's Doing awesome. interviews. I learned how to talk like this watching Michael Jordan interviews. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just everything. The way that I carry myself in my profession. The way that I, uh, you know, try to treat people with kindness and and just it's just doing the right thing, putting in the work, being determined to be great. I got all that from Michael Jordan. My dad wasn't in my life. Mm. You know, so I, I got all that from Michael Jordan. And that's incredible and that old someone from the streets. Say that one more time. I'm sorry. I got all that from Michael Jordan and old homeless people from the streets. That's incredible that someone, uh, a celebrity like that, could have a father figure effect on you like yeah. that. That's pretty incredible. Yeah, I and mean, it was it was just amazing, man. The guy was 
it's just unbelievable, man. I, I I can't even really describe it. I'm like lost for words when I when I try to think about it. But he had a huge impact on my life. And it's, do you it's, think you'll ever get the opportunity to meet him? I think it'll happen. I just don't want it to end up like chameleonaires. <laughs> what happened with his? I'm not familiar. Well, chameleonaires a rapper. You know? Right. I know. I know who he is. But what happened with Michael? Well, what happened was chameleonaire was asked to do this event that Michael Jordan was doing. It's like his daughter's birthday party or something. Chameleon that comes and does all his songs, but he brings all his memorabilia, all his Michael Jordan jerseys, everything he wants. He wants to just, he wants that moment with Michael Jordan. And he goes over to Michael Jordan, can I take a picture with you? Can you sign this autograph? And Michael said something like, man, I don't sign autographs for guys. <laughs> something like that. And he was like, man, I just spent, you know, Twenty thousand dollars for this jersey for this benefit, and you can't sign it. He's like, I tell you what, you give me, you know, fifty thousand dollars, I sign that autograph and take a picture with you. But it just it rubbed chameleon the wrong way, and I don't know if that really happened, but that's that's chameleon their story. I mean, you can right. look it up on YouTube. It's it's really really bad, but I just don't want it to be that way. And they always say, you know, some of your heroes are the biggest a holes. You know, yeah. And then with the last dance coming out, I realized how big my hero was. Yeah. How much yeah. of an a-hole he was. But he was just pushing his – I think Michael Jordan was just pushing people because he wanted to win. And yeah. I don't see anything wrong with that. But but if I ever had that moment, I just – I don't want to be hurt by him. I just, you know, one, one of my biggest, uh, I guess, heroes from my teenage years, uh, growing up, my dad was a preacher, Pentecostal preacher. Yeah. It, hard religion. Uh, you know, there were a lot of things that I was not allowed to do, um, you know, and, and basically was beaten over the head with religion. Now, I've since reconnected my life with God. I, I play on my worship team at church and so forth. But there was a period from about 14 years old till I moved out when I was 18, 19, where it was a struggle and a, a lot of self-esteem issues, a lot of uh, just a lot of stuff. And it was a lot of religious based. And at that time, 1997 to 2001, what's one of the biggest rock bands on the planet? Creed. Creed, yeah. So one of my idols from back in those days was Scott Stapp, the lead singer. Yeah. And I've always wanted to meet him, and I almost did. I came that close. Uh, back in 2005, I worked at a radio station called Q102 in Cincinnati. And I had showed up. Uh, I did commercial production before I went on the air, so... I showed up to do some commercial production at like four. Uh, Brian, a guy named Brian Douglas was doing afternoons on the air. And then uh, I came on at seven and I did seven to midnight. Well, I got there, went up, got my production load for the day. And then went back downstairs to our, our lower level where our pr production studios were. And I guess in that moment in the elevators, Scott Stapp was going up the elevator to do an interview with Brian on the afternoon show. I went down to do commercials and was down there for a couple hours, came out, went back upstairs to do my show at 7, and Scott and his team just left. So literally, I missed him on the way up, yeah. and I missed him on the way down. So I was that close that to close. meeting him. That close, man. But, uh, but I'm, you know, and then, and then shortly thereafter, he had like a big public uh, down spiral and everything, but he yeah. seems like he's got his life back together. That, that kind of scares me. If I ever got to talk to him, would that change – Maybe what I thought of him and his music from my childhood. I don't know. It might might not. Might have. Might not. But that's the way life goes, man. And that's why. That's <laughs> what all the people say. <laughs> Lando, you got a sound check. We've been talking for an yes, hour sir. now. I am so grateful for you being on here. Do me a favor. When you get that new original music ready to go, text me. Let's do another podcast to promote the album. I'd love to do Definitely. it. Definitely. That is awesome, bro. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. All right, man. Kill it tonight. Have a great show. I love you, brother. Thank you for doing this for me. Love you, too. Thanks, man. West Virginia love, baby.